Very good. I think we're just going to make a start now. Uh, I've got 30 people online. Uh, we're recording the event anyway, so um, if anyone misses it or misses the start, then they can watch the on, watch on YouTube. Um, so yeah, just um, today's event is all about accounting basics. Uh, we've, we do this a uh, couple of times a year, uh, once with the Gorilla and one with, with uh, Centra. So today's event is uh, going through the basics of accounting and uh, the team at Gorilla, uh, Dan, Craig and Richard, they're going to go through um, how to set up the accounts, what's the best way to do it, uh, how to be more tax efficient as a locum, and some of the changes that are coming up uh, with the new emergency budgets and uh, potential changes to uh, taxes. Um, so yeah, over to you, Dan. Great. Thanks, Tohil. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for letting us join your, your webinar today. Um, we've done a couple of these now. Uh, with the pharmacy cooperative um so yeah we we are gorilla accounting um we're, we're a national firm i've got myself I'm, I'm one of the directors we've got craig whelan who heads up our new business team um, and we've got richard hepburn um, who's our head of operations um you can't see richard his camera's not working but he's there you'll be able to hear him um so uh, just quickly on us we specialize in in the self-employed sector um, so we've got just under 4,000 clients all over the UK, uh, um, and there are 99% of them are, are self-employed, whether that's as a locum, uh, as a consultant, a contractor, freelancer, et cetera, sole trader. Um, we, we, we cover the full spectrum. Um, over the past seven years, we've, we've, we've advised uh, around 15,000 self-employed uh, people like yourselves. So there's no situation that we've not come across there's no question that we've not been asked. Um, and today, uh, Tohedal's asked us to just 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 highlight some of the key issues that you guys will come across, whether you're self-employed currently, um, or you're planning to become self-employed, or you may be both employed currently and doing some local work on the side as well. We'll cover all issues, like the main key issues today, um, and hopefully everybody will um, will get something from this session. So we are going to take questions. Uh, Tohedal, are you running the the chat feature? Uh, can people post? yes um, i'll manage the chat so um any questions come up, i'll give you guys a shot yeah we will we will give a q a session at the end uh, but you know as we move along if something pops up that you want to ask just feel free to, to put it in the chat and we'll try and cover it as we move along um i'll um i'll i'll, I'll conduct the agenda uh, we'll move through the key topics i'll i'll fire questions at the guys um play almost a bit of a devil's advocate and, and ask the type of questions that i think you'll find the answers to useful um, so we'll kick off uh with 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 um an absolute basic which is the difference between sole traders and limited companies um you know if i'm if i'm new to becoming a locum what's the difference when's it more efficient to look at a limited company uh, richard if you if you can help with this one uh, yep. What are the different types of structure, tax, benefits of each, compliance, et cetera, et cetera? Um, yeah, over to you, Richard. Yeah, so um, there's two main setups, as Dan uh, mentioned. It's working as self-employed or through a limited company. Um, the sole trader option, um, with, with this option, it's you as the individual that will be uh, not only working, but taxed as an individual. Uh, and in sort of the eyes of the entity, it's just yourself that uh, um, will be looked at, whereas a limited company is separate. And even though you may be working and classed as self-employed, it will be the limited company that will be um, charging for work and um, the face of, of, of your services, and you are completely separate to that. Um, so starting off with being a sole trader, um, with this option, um, the tax is a little bit different than um, than a limited company. In most cases, it's not as tax efficient, so you're likely to pay more more tax with this setup. And the main reason for that is um, the national insurance that's that's going to be due. So similar to having um, a, an employee role where you're working for a company, um, with being a sole trader, the um, there, there's na national insurance charged on your income. Um, so that's that's the main difference as far as that that goes. Um, the, the, the with with both options you can claim expenses and um, they're broadly the same. There's a few differences, but you know if it's an allowable cost, it will work both ways. 
with the limited company, um, as I said before, it's a separate entity. So you may be the face of it and doing the work, but you would be, a sole, would be a sole. Uh, you you would be uh, classed as um, the director of the company, um, a shareholder of the company, and also possibly an employee of the company, so you can receive a salary. Now the main benefit of doing this is that the you, you, in, in many cases you can end up with a paying a lot of uh, sorry a lower rate of tax. And that's the main reason is you can set your salary at a lower amount before the national insurance threshold and you would um, pay yourself a salary up to that amount before any ta any national insurance is charged. Um, from that, that point, you would pay yourself dividends from the company profit. Um, the dividend ta tax rates are lower than income tax rates for self-employed or, or salary. So it's 8.75% in the basic rate versus 20% um, as a sole trader and uh, an employee. And once you go into the, the high rates, 33.75 versus 40%. So there is a tax saving personally um, on doing it that way. Um, and there's, a, there's some other things as well that can work out in a more, you, you know, to make things tax, uh, uh, you know, lower, lower your tax bill a little bit. So for example, with the limited company, you can have um, different different shareholdings of the company. So let's say, for example, yourself and your spouse were shareholders, then the income would be split that way between yourselves. So there, there are ways to set up the company to uh, result in potentially paying paying less tax. So Richard, um, just very briefly, if I'm so I'm new to, to being a local pharmacist, my income is going to be between forty and fifty five thousand a year. What am I best doing? Yeah, so you, you're better going with a limited company. It's it's going to work out the, the tax bill, and and we can obviously this is something that we do on a daily basis. We can work out a, a comparison and say, look, this is what you're going to pay as a sole trader. This is what you're going to pay as a limited company, and you can then see why that would work out better. But the main reason is that is the national insurance, and and just just on that as well, that there is a the, there is one other thing to consider, and that's. As a sole trader, you're going to get taxed on all your income in that tax year. So no matter how much you earn, if you have a good year, you're going to get taxed on that. With a limited company, you can be a bit more flexible with how you draw the money out of the company because you're paying dividends from, from the profit. Now, bear in mind, you do pay a corporation tax before you can access that profit. But once that's sitting in the company, if you have a, a good year, you know that, that money will sit in the company. You don't need to draw the whole amount and make yourself a high rate taxpayer. You can leave some of those funds sat in the company and then draw them, um, draw the dividends down in a, in a future year. Maybe you have a quieter year, spread that out, or um, you know, have a bit of rest from the, the the local work that you're doing. There'll still be some profit in the company that you can utilize um, whenever you need to. So it's a bit more flexible. Richard, so you've 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 kind of touched on this in your answer there, but if I'm doing if I'm doing both. So if I'm currently an if I'm currently employed and I'm doing some locum work here and there or on the side, how, how does that tie into the limited company? How does that all work? Yeah, well, no, that's a good point. So there's nothing to stop you from working uh, as an employee and also as a limited company if you're doing some side work, similar with being a sole trader as well. So again, you know, you can look at if you've had a, um, a an employee role. And, and you know you you're a high rate taxpayer in that tax year, then you know there is a benefit from having the limited company because you don't need to take as much money out as as the limited company. You can let that roll over. You, there is a tax free dividend allowance of two thousand pounds, which each each individual can can utilise. So, um, you know the answer is that there's nothing to stop you from working doing locum shifts through a limited company and also working in a, a normal salaried role. That's something we see quite often. Uh, and sometimes we see people move between the two and have the limited company there in the background and we'll do an engagement for six months, maybe through a limited company and then move on to a different role. And they've still got that company there to pick up a few shifts or if they get a more, um, you know, a longer term contract, it's there ready, ready to go. OK, um, and Richard, if, if I've set up a limited company uh, in terms of ongoing costs of that company, what do I have to file at company's house? What are the other compliance requirements uh, around being a director of a limited company and having my own limited company uh, aside just from the tax? What else do I need to do on an annual basis? 
No, that's that's a good point, Dan. So there are further requirements having a limited company. So, um, you know, you're required to file annual accounts each year with Companies House and a corporation tax return, um, as well as, you know, the self-assessment, which you would also need to do as a, as a sole trader. So, you know, I think the, you, the, it's definitely more um, of a requirement to have an accountant. Um, obviously, we as accountants help out with advice anyway with sole traders, but the actual filing of the accounts, corporation tax return, um, you know, it's an extra responsibility with the limited company route. Yeah. And what about VAT, Richard? How does how does VAT tie into all this? How's that affect it, if it does at all? Again, yeah, it does. It, 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 it's a requirement. So once your um, income goes over the threshold of £85,000, then either as a sole trader or as a limited company, there is a requirement to register for VAT. Now, some some of our customers, a lot of them, it's better to register for, for VAT anyway, depending on who your customers are. Um, you know, registering for VAT, not only do you charge VAT on your services, but you can reclaim VAT on your um, expenses. So um, at the end of the day, if you're invoicing a company that's VAT registered, they can reclaim the VAT on there anyway. So it's neither here nor there if, if you're VAT registered. But for a small business like yourselves, you do benefit from um, either using the flat rate scheme and paying over a reduced rate of VAT, but um, or, or also using the normal scheme. And um, what's, sorry, Richard, but, what's the flat rate scheme? What's, can you just talk just, just, the difference? The difference. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, the flat rate the scheme. Flat rate scheme is some, oh, that's a bit of uh, yeah, the flat rate scheme. Sorry, is it, just make sure can mute that, please. Turn off, please. Yes, sorry. The flat rate scheme, um, it was designed for small businesses. Um, and basically what the HMRC have said is it can reduce the admin side of um, working, uh, being VAT registered for a small business. So if your turnover um, does not exceed £150,000 or is not expected to, you can register for the flat rate VAT scheme. And what it is, is um, you don't reclaim VAT on any expenses. You charge VAT as normal on your services that you're invoicing to your customers. And then you pay a reduced rate of VAT over. So the reduced rate is supposed to be calculated on what they expect you to be able to reclaim on your expenses. So... Um, <laughs> But for most most uh, of our clients, the class is something called a limited cost trader. So they don't have much goods to reclaim VAT on. And what, what happens is the VAT is charged at 20%. And then the rate of VAT paid over is looks at the total amount on the invoice. And then 16.5% is, is applied to that. There is a saving in the first year. So it would be 15.5% for the first year. So the amount you pay over to HMRC is a is a lower rate than the amount that you charge, and also you don't have the hassle of looking through all your receipts of the VAT that's, that you've been charged on your expenses, adding those on. You just look at the amount you charge to your customers. However, again, you can't reclaim the VAT on your costs. So that's another thing for us to look at. We will calculate the best way to go, and which is going to you know create you the best saving in 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 the way you work for going forward okay so um i'm i'm i'm, I'm a locum pharmacist it's it, i've come to the conclusion that financially and tax wise it's much more efficient for me to trade as a limited company craig can you just talk us through how do i set up a limited company what kind of costs are involved what's that process can i do it myself etc yeah, of course. So setting up the limited company itself, it's a relatively straightforward process. Um, company can be incorporated within 24 hours. Um, we do offer the service um, to do that. We charge a fee of £50 plus VAT um, for the company registration. And that basically covers the registration at Companies House, which would incorporate that, that separate entity that Richard uh, was referring to earlier. Um, moving forward from there, there's then obviously certain HMRC registrations that are required. Again, we, we would cover those. Now, you know, in answer to your question, Dan, yes, you can form a company uh, directly with Companies House. It is something that some of our clients do and then bring that to us. Either way, really, um, the, the simple reason we offer the service, a lot of people don't want the hassle or the risk of doing it wrong and then having to make amendments. It, it's just something that you know, we're doing this 
day in day out so we we, we kind of know what what's happening with that set it up with the right um industry codes to make sure it's relevant to the work that you're doing as well um so yeah that 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 is the the registration process you know on the flip side if it was to be that you were maybe going down the sole trader route as richard spoke to uh, spoke about earlier that's just simply a case again of registering yourself as a self-employed individual with company's house and we can talk you through the process of doing that great okay um so back to you richard i've i've, um, I've set up a limited company um i've got to file my annual accounts as a director of that company etc what about a tax return self-assessment tax return do i still need to do them how is it different from a sole trader tax return etc and when do i need to do them yeah no that's that's a good point so being um we're operating through a limited company um it doesn't mean that you know a self-assessment is no longer required um it's just a bit different than as a as a, as a sole trader um, so with, with the limited company routes, um, you will most likely be receiving dividends from the company. So as I mentioned before, the dividend, the tax rate on dividends is actually lower than the income tax you pay on a salary or as as um, a sole trader. But those dividends um, have not had any tax deduction from them. So they do need to be reported on the self on the self assessment each year. Um, as I said before, the tax rates of uh, it's first two thousand pound tax free. That's after any that fall in the personal allowance, which would also be tax free. And then um, the tax rate of eight point seven five percent is applied for any any dividends you receive in the basic rate. Um, and just on that, with you know some good tax planning, which is something else that we we do with our clients, we always run down. It's it, you know you can work it out. So um, providing you know you don't require any more income and there's enough profit there that. You can restrict how much you pay yourself so you receive income uh, at that lower rate of tax and cap that off in the tax year so it's good planning to pay yourself as much as you can in that lower rate and then uh, see where you are after that um but yeah with the self-assessment the dividends are, are added on there and then the tax is calculated and paid over to hmrc um so for, for both sole traders and you know, you know um limited company directors and shareholders or anyone requiring to do a self-assessment the the, um, the deadlines and the period uh, work the same so the period that's looked at is a tax year so it's from the 6th of april one year to the 5th of april the following year so the current tax year 2022-23 6th of april 2022 to 5th of april 2023 now you get you get quite a bit of time before the, the, the tax return needs to be filed so it would only be due uh, the 31st of, of january the following year so 31st of january 2024 um it is good planning to you know work out your tax before then get the self-assessment done because uh, as you know with being self-employed self-employed either as through sole trader or limited company there's going to be tax due on that self-assessment so it's always a good idea to put a bit of money aside ready for the uh, payment date and know where you stand on that and that's part of our job as well to sort of keep you updated and calculate like these things and you know you're ready to go which you know just just thinking we we do with a lot of people that have only worked and in employed roles and moving to the first contract or starting welcoming so it, it is a bit of a shift because like us, you know, people are used to having their uh, tax just deducted on the pay slip. Whatever lands in the bank, that's their money. You can do what you want with, but it's a little bit different um, working through, you know, if you sole trader or even more so as a limited company because that money in the company, it's not yours until you've been paid it. And then there's potentially personal tax due. So, you know, it is a it is a strong sort of argument to have an accountant to work these things out with you. And so, you know, where you stand because you know if you're not used to sort of working this way or running a business then you know that's uh tax sort of advice really re really is uh useful that's uh that was about to be the next question richard you know how do i know how much of the money that's coming into the company bank account is actually mine uh, there's a common misconception and we see this all the time particularly with people that are new to being self-employed 
they, they make that that grave mistake of thinking everything that comes into the account is theirs, which is which is obviously incorrect. Um, you know, the, what, what's 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 yours is the responsibility to make sure everybody who's who's due something is is paid the right amount. Um, you know, so the, the the trick to that is making sure obviously you've got a very very good bookkeeping uh, system, or you're using a, a very good piece of software, which will come on to. Um, in a second with 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 Craig. Um, Richard, just briefly, you've mentioned, so, so I'm a limited company, I know I've got to do my tax return every year, I've got to file annual accounts on behalf of the company every year. Um, you've mentioned about expenses, can you just, just talk us through that? So how does that work? How do I actually log them? What kind of things can I expense for? Um, just talk us through that, if you would, please. Yeah, so with, you know, working for yourself, um, or having a business, then there are expenses that you can claim. So HMRC allow these to be tax deductible. So whatever you pay in the expense is going to uh, reduce the um, taxable profits. And that, that works both for, you know, sole traders and those operating through a limited company. So the, there is a sort of general definition that HMRC use and that is it's wholly and exclusively for business. So is that something that you require to pay to, to, to run your business? Um, so a lot of things, you know, mobile phone is one, you, you, you know, you can have a mobile phone through the business and use it for personal calls as well as, it's, as long as it's in the business name. So that's something that you can do. Obviously things, you, you know, you may need insurance and most likely you, that that's something that you would need to, to operate. Um, you know, professional subscriptions, which I'm sure you all have. We have them as as well as uh, accountants. And I know that obviously in your profession, that's something that's that's also will be required. Um, but there are other things that you may not sort of realise. So, um, and the main thing uh, it, it, that's a bit different than with someone operating, you know, how you, you guys do and us as employees, things like travel, uh, mileage, um, meals, things like that, because if, you, if you're working at a locum and you're working at different sites and you're not st stuck at working for one uh, employer, then um, it means that you, the, the, the site that you're traveling to can be classed as a temporary workplace. So I'd give an example. If I work for Gorilla, our office is here in Bolton. But if I was required to go and work in another office that we have, for example, London, then, you know, I think it'd be expected that, that the company pays for those costs to travel down, which would happen. Similarly, with your business, if you're working at different sites or if working at one site for, for that you don't expect to be there for more than two years, then it's, it's, it's classed as a temporary workplace. So you can claim for the travel costs, mileage, if you need to stay over, uh, any accommodation, um, plus meals while you're at the um, temporary working location. So that's one um, that's one big thing that that, you know, self-employed can benefit from. Um, uh, Richard, Richard, how do I how do I actually log that mileage and how, how does that actually work? Are the rates, uh, you know, how does how does it all work? Yeah. So if you use your personal car for business travel, it's it's charged at forty five pence per mile, uh, up to ten thousand miles. So what um, how that's logged? It, we'd advise sort of keeping you, sh you should keep a log of each each journey. Now you can do that on a spreadsheet, but we use a software called Free Agent. Now it's really good because um, your business bank account links up to it. You can prepare your invoices on there. We're going to come um, on to in a minute, Rich. Yeah, well, yeah. So we'll cover that. But on Free Agent, you can also log your expenses. So if you pay for any expenses personally or do any mileage, add that on there, and it'll keep a tally of how much is owed to you at any given time, and you can just take that back. It's a bit like how an expense claim form works, but it's digitally synced to the to the software so um yeah keep a log of the mileage multiply that by 45 pence and um you know that's how much you rode from the company okay brilliant so um that leads us nicely on to bookkeeping um so craig what, what would we recommend here obviously it's uh we're busy guys you know if you yeah. self-employed as a locum um, um, you know, what do I do? How, how do I keep track of all this? Is it, is it written notes? Is it an Excel spreadsheet? What can you advise me? Yeah, so the the days of paper based and Excel spreadsheets, are, you know, seems to be far behind us with the uh, the rollout of making tax digital. 
uh, from HMRC. So it is really, really important. And you know, it's one of the key points that we kind of, you know, banged on about to our clients is record keeping is a must to, to have that good record keeping. Not only does it ensure that you're, you're able to stay compliant with the, the requirements from um, HMRC, it also allows us as accountants and you know you, you yourself as individuals to see where you're up to. Um, it allows us to give more effective planning and advice to ensure that when we get to the end of the year, you know we're quite happy to say that you're in the best possible position you could be. Um, you know the the days of having um, you know bagging up all your invoices and receipts and taking them into an accountant at the end of the year, you know hindsight's a marvelous thing. You can't always go back and change something that happened eight nine months ago. You know that that time has passed. It's almost retrospectively just looking back and and filing accounts on what's happened so you know i wouldn't say we the, the software that we use it doesn't give you like management accounts but it gives you a live dashboard so as richard said we use free agent so you can see 24 7 based on all the income that you've had within that year all the expenses that you've put through as well you can see clearly what profit you have available what needs to be kept aside to cover vat corporation tax um, and you can see what's available for you to take um, and it is really key that it is one of the, the most important points is that record keeping because it makes everybody's lives easier um, you know from, from start to finish. Craig uh, uh, you mentioned a bank account how, how would that work Do, you know can I use my personal bank account my limited company do I have to set one up for the company how, how does that all work? Yeah, so as a, as a limited company, you are required to have a separate limited company bank account in the name of the limited company, because as Richard alluded to earlier, it is a separate legal entity to you as an individual. So you would need to have a separate account. Now, what free agent can do is actually directly tie in with the, the bank account. So it automatically pulls the transactions through as when you log into that system. And that's what allows you to keep that live accounting figure, you know, that live dashboard view. It's not that you're, you know, you're waiting for us to go in and do anything behind the scenes. It's 24 seven now. Um, just touching on the point regarding the expenses that Richard mentioned, it allows you to, there's the mobile app available for free agent and, you know, many other accounting softwares as well, um, as well as the online portal. So for example, on the go, you're out, you're working at a temporary place of work, you know, and you go out and get some lunch. You can simply take a picture of the receipts on the app, upload it straight to the system. That qualifies as the electronic copy of that receipt. You don't need to maintain the paper-based copies and it's automatically stored and accounted for on that entry. So that's job done. You know, we're not asking you to spend hours and hours of bookkeeping. The, the idea of bookkeeping is almost redundant with an online system like like free agent you know quickbook zero the sage there's, there's a lot out there but just actually logging the entry almost does the bookkeeping entry now um bookkeeping is, is almost a redundant phrase um as long as you maintain the records you, you'll be absolutely fine anything else that i should be thinking of craig in terms of setup are there any other products that i need as a self-employed but yeah as a locum in particular what what kind of things should I also be thinking about now I've got my limited company and I've got my bank account? Yes, there's a few things that you, you, you would need to consider that are, are additional expenses outside of, of accountancy. One of the main ones would be insurance. Um, you know, I'm sure within the profession that you're in, be that as part of your, um, you know, your, your, your ongoing CPD or your, you know, your accreditation uh, fees, but more than likely you will have to have separate insurance through business, which is use of professional indemnity and public liability. And that's just basically protecting the business uh, uh, as, a, as an entity. If a member of the public or a company you were working for was to take action against you for you know negligence whatever that may be you need to have that cover in place and a lot of the time the client that you're working for will stipulate what cover you need in place and as to what level that cover needs to be um you know we do partner with a, a, a couple of insurance firms that if you were to come through to ourselves we can put you in touch with and um, or you know alternatively there are a lot of insurance providers out there that you can use but that is something you know we would always say to have have in place uh, someone's got the hand up there to edel uh, um not had a single question through yet no we haven't uh, we've we've all seen the questions. They're, usually, they're usually firing in so is hi that, is that is that working yep go on hi there fire away 
Um, basically, do you know how you have supermarket pharmacies? A lot of them ask you questions whether you are have a like you know a limited company and stuff or something called IR35. Now I don't understand what that means. Are we allowed to have a lim limited company if we work for them, or are we not? Okay, so yeah, IR35 is, is a key point. Uh, I'll probably say, you know, more so in, you know, in professional services and industries like yourself. Um, IR35 is basically a piece of tax legislation that was introduced um, 22 years ago. It's back in the year 2000 that was first rolled out to combat disguised employment. So basically somebody doing a role that HMRC would see much as though you should be an employee, um, but if you did it as a limited company, you'd potentially pay quite a lot less tax. So this ruling was brought in to combat that. Now, there were changes rolled out in April of 2021, um, which basically put the responsibility of determining the IR35 status on the end client. And, and when I say the end client, I mean the company that you are actually providing your services to. So this is the so, supermarket that you're Yeah, exactly. So the supermarket. So they will tell you whether it's inside or outside IR35. And um, if it is to be inside IR35, the limited company isn't always the best option to go. Um, for the simple reason being, it's almost them saying, if you're caught by that ruling, HMRC would treat that income as employment income. So the next best option, if that was the case, would be to go down the self-employed sole trader route, which Richard mentioned earlier on. So you potentially pay more tax than you would if it was outside IR35 for a limited company. But as a sole trader, you still then have the ability to offset certain costs um, and expenses. Um, so it will work out better than being a direct employee of that um, specific end client. Um, so I've just got one question. Um, we've had some instances where, uh, where the, there's agencies that do, that allow people to work under the umbrellas you know, the umbrella companies uh, mm. where they sort out all the taxes. So if it's so when in, right now, there's uh, three companies that will only allow you to work for them if you um, if you're a sole trader, which is a Lloyd's Pharmacy, Superdrug and I think one of the other supermarkets, which is uh, Morrison's, I think, uh, basically the ones that use Venlock uh, as a booking platform. Uh, all the other companies I know will allow you to work through a limited company. But again, there are agencies that will allow you to work through them uh, under Umbrella. Now, is it better, more efficient to work through Umbrella or is it better to just go, go work for them as sole trader? The, the sole um, Oh God! Sorry. Yeah. Is that a... So go on, Richard. I'll let you take yeah. that one. You, you'll end, you, you will you will pay less tax as a sole trader um, because what happens is the amount paid the the your umbrella cuts out employers and I as well as the NI that the employee pays. So the actual if you if the amount invoiced is the same, you will come out with um, more money as a sole trader. But that that that's that's fine. As and the other thing is. With the umbrella, they, they, there won't be any, you know, expenses available. So I don't know. It, it, it is a bit of a, a bit of a grey area as well because, you know, if you're looking at uh, IR35 and they're saying, well, actually, you're working as an employee, um, then, you know, there's an argument that, that if they're saying that, you shouldn't be working as a sole trader. So I think that they've got things sort of stuck in the middle there and they're trying to avoid something, but not really dealing with it properly, I would say. It's worth, it's worth just flagging up here at a macro level that that they shouldn't, you know, it's, it's a grey area, this. And part of the problem is the IR35 changes to the private sector are still very, very new. Um, you know, they only, they only came in um, uh, last year. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the, initially the, the end users, the companies that it affects at the end, because the risk ultimately moved up the supply chain, um, it now sits with the end user. Now, the immediate reaction there, um, particularly in the medical fields, I mean, we've seen this, this isn't just affecting your sector, we saw it particularly with the vets. You know, the, the, the sort of the six main corporations at the end, they just they just put the shutters down and just said we will not be using limited companies at all. Um, and they blanket assessed everyone um, as, as being inside our 35. Now, the guidelines state that they should not be blanket assessing everybody 
as inside IR35. So what, the, and again, this, this has really changed over the last 12 months, thank God. It's, it's gone full circle, um, as we saw a few years back when they introduced these changes into the public sector. The private sector has gone exactly the same way. But clearly, as you've alluded to, there's still a couple of companies out there that are still are still nervous about using limited companies because of this risk. So the three that you've mentioned there, Tohidal, they're not blanket assessing. They're just simply saying we are not going to use contractors, uh, mm. or limited companies, sorry, yeah. at all. Um, which is which is really frustrating. Um, but I suspect at some point, you know, in the future, that will change. Um, you know, to remain competitive, they're going to have to have to have to you know embrace it and, and put some processes in place um you know uh, we've we've seen obviously speaking to yourself to we see we've seen a lot of this um over the last 12 months and it does seem to be getting better yeah i think that the one the biggest one is lloyd's pharmacy and they're they're the ones that have been struggling the most they've had the most closures um in the last few months as well uh, i think of all the closure reports about 70 to 80 percent was just from lloyd's pharmacy it was interesting when when was it was it 17 when the public changes came in chaps yes yeah, yeah. So, so in april 2017 they did something similar in the public sector so we had a load of locum doctors that were working for the nhs trust and, and they just literally put the shutters down and said we again we won't be using um, or, or anybody who is limited will just assume they're inside and you know they quickly realized that you know they needed them skill sets and and they put some some decent process so it does eventually go full circle uh, but that that doesn't help you know you guys when you're dealing with these companies on, on the front line it, it must be frustrating yeah yeah um and we've we've had this back and forth for i think over two years i think you guys helped us uh pen that letter as well to uh the company association uh about dealing with uh ir35 especially around Lloyd's pharmacy and a couple of the other the of the other members uh they just completely ignored it was well, again, like I said, there's the, the evidence is that they've had the biggest closures of any company in the country. Uh, and I think okay. with time, they'll probably, they will have to change the way of working. Otherwise, they'll have even less of a uh, pool of locums to work with. Yeah, it, like I say, if it's any consolation, we've seen this across other sectors as well. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, it's funny, the, the, the ironic thing is with, um, you know, the, the fact that they're willing to engage with sole traders, it almost gives them a greater risk than if they were to engage with, you know, do a, a correct assessment and take on limited company individuals, you know, with a correct I-35 assessment, because working with a sole trader, it's not a business to business engagement. So the potentially open themselves up for liability. I know that's probably going down a rabbit hole with that one, but um, I think they are an investigation by the HMRC anyway, from what I've heard. Uh, I know the, the HMRC has been uh, reaching out to a few other uh, supermarket chains as well. So I think there is some investigation going on at the moment about this uh, way of working. Um, well, hoping that will uh, sort itself out, like you said, uh, over yeah. the next year or two. Um, so we've just got a couple of hands up at the moment. One from Uju, is it? Have I got it right? Yes, we have. Thank you. Um, I think I missed the beginning and apologies if you may have talked about this already in terms of the decision between um, a limited company and a sole trader. And my question in regard to that was around, well, what I've seen, because I'm part of the group that Tohido made, the TPC, um, you know, and we have these discussions. And one of the things that was said was that if you're on average earning probably not 18, 20K, then you probably don't need to go down the route of a limited company. But my question is in the other way around. So what if you're like employed and you're a higher tax earner in your employment, but you want to still be able to work on the side? What is the best way? Because obviously going through the self-employed route, your tax is just through the roof. Um, is that the only option or is, it, is there a limit because you're not earning enough in your if you like, local main role to be able to do a limited company. Have I asked my question? Is it clear? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We, we did just, we did touch on this at the start. Um, so, so, so sorry you missed that. We did, we did talk about this, but Richard, if you can just, just, just pick that up and, and, and address the points. Yeah, it, it would still, in, in our city, be more, uh, you pay less tax doing it through a limited company. Um, so, yeah, the tax rates, we, we can calculate all that. The only difference is that there are, as we said before, there's some more additional filing requirements for limited company 
you know, they, they, they can actually find with companies' house, you know, and corporation tax return. So there is more uh, responsibilities with that route. And um, like I said, you're probably going to need to pay an accountant to do that for you. So it, it's really a case of weighing up whether that extra cost is worth doing it. Uh, you know, you're, you're probably... Richard, from a tax perspective, though, if I, you know, if, we're, if, if, if as a locum I'm earning, let's say, sixty thousand a year, it, what kind of savings can I expect generally? Obviously, you know, everybody's different, but generally, what kind of savings can I expect to reap from switching to a limited company? If I'm optimizing my, if I'm taking a minimum salary versus a, versus a maximum dividend, what what kind of savings realistically, tax wise, put aside the costs, but tax wise, what am I looking at? It's it's it's, it's difficult to put a figure on it, so we. It does vary. And now if you were looking at, we could do a direct tax comparison. If you were looking at X amount received, we'd have to take into account all your other income that you've had. So if you do, like, for example, if you've got a job as well, that needs to go into the tax calculation. And um, so there's there's a lot of different factors. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's something we'd need to do on an individual basis. And we do these comparisons, like I said, daily. So if you wanted to know what the, the best option was, we could do that. We could plug in the accountancy fees, so you know that um, you know with the limited company, if you've also paid an accountant as well, this is what you'd come home with. And because the tax rates vary depending on how much other income you've got and the way that you're paying yourself, it, it's it's hard to sort of give a give a figure. Uh, it, you know, it's not it's not a percentage or anything like that. It's it really does vary with the amount of of income and your personal circumstances, but. Um, the top and bottom of it are the limited company is better as far as the, the tax position goes. You pay lower rates of tax when you receive that income personally. So in uh, most cases, it's, it, it is the, the best option. And it's worth just saying as well, without without trying to sound too salesy, we do actually have a free uh, take on pay calculator on our website, which you might find useful. You can you can tap in your your numbers. And it will give a, it'll throw out the figures to show you what kind of, um, so you can run the comparisons and what kind of take on pay you'd, uh, you'd receive, limited versus non limited. And just, um, just following up on that, sorry, I was just going to say some, some accountants will say, you know, um, if you work for a limited company, put, put aside 20% for your tax or 25%. It really doesn't work like that because it, it all depends on how much income your company receives and how much you're paying yourself because of tax rates. Um, the, the, the amount charged depends on how much income you've got. Once you get into the high rate tax threshold, you're going to pay a high rate tax, whether that's through salary, self-employed sole trader or dividend income. So it, it, it does need looking at on a case by case basis. If anyone's any questions on this, we'll, you know, we can we I've got another we've got another big top, topic to talk about after this, but we may as well uh, address any questions now related to this. There's a few hands up, I think. So he'll yeah, sorry, I've just posted the uh, the link for the calculator for anyone who's interested in having a look. Um, so I think we had one hand up from Hamza first. Hello, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks for your time, gentlemen. I just um, I just wanted to go back to the IR35 point. I feel yeah. it's quite important because a lot of pharmacies, they're sort of closing their doors to the public and then deceiving them to say that pharmacists aren't interest in working or there's a shortage which is in my eyes clear deception and uh, just falsehood so in terms of getting around IR35 I've had a word with a few accountants and I don't know if these are viable options if they're even legal so you all know more about these than I do but let me just ask so one option I had was to get around it you mix up the companies you work for in a month so you work across a few different ones that way if you're not if you're working for Boots 90% of the time you might fall into IR35. That's the first segment I wanted to ask. And the second part was, could I, in theory, work for a Lloyd's, give my current account details, not business account, and move the money back to myself to a business account? Is that allowed? No, so just to touch on the, the initial point uh, of working at multiple locations, it is a, a very common misconception. Um, IR35 is per engagement. So... The ruling that, that came in with the changes in April of last year means that for every single engagement you have, you should be given what's called a, a status determination statement. So it could even be that you work, you know, 
five days a week for Lloyds and then you maybe do one day a week at Boots. It could be the fact that that one day at Boots is inside IR35 and the rest are outside. You could have an outside IR35 role for 12 months. It's all about that individual engagement. The structure of your business, the number of clients that you have will not affect IR35 status at all because it's her engagement rather than your limited company. It's based on the clients that you're actually working for. It's worth pointing out as well that with although although the shift, although the risk has moved now and, it, and, and the responsibility sits with the end user, um, you can still get an IR35 determination done for yourself and 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 they're pretty inexpensive i mean craig how much, how much is it generally um but usually you're looking at about 50 pounds for, for an i35 assessment so this will be a third party you usually a, a legal firm who will look at your contract they'll look at your systems the way you do things they'll go through the entire different elements of the prescribed tests for ir35 and they'll effectively give you a decision now it's not you know like i say it's now with the end user to use but even so if hmrc ever looked at your circumstances and it ever got challenged it would still be good practice on your part for the sake of 50 quid to have that piece of paper there and to have a determination so yeah you know just fo just following on from that we yeah. recommend people do that i think just moving on to your the second point of your your question getting paid into a personal and transferring into a limited company you know that that simply cannot be done any any funds that are paid to your personal account so that for it to be paid into your personal account means that the engagement that you have with that client that makes that payment is with you as a, as a private individual rather than your limited company that being the case it needs to be declared as, as self-employment income as a sole trader that that's the the be all and end all of that unfortunately um should you move it to the limited company it would still be, need to be classed as, as self-employment income. There'd be no benefit in you moving it to a limited company because then it would be seen as ink for the company, it would be subject to corporation tax, then it would be subject to tax to get that out again. So you're not actually saving anything. Um, should HMRC ever look at that and notice the old sponsor originally paid to your personal account, this should be treated as, as self-employment income. I suspect that second question ties into some of the, again, uh, we, we've seen this a few times where the end user, one of them you've already mentioned to Lidl, has said, you know, whether you're a limited company or not, we're going to pay you into your personal bank account regardless. The, you know, the thinking being that that, that discharged their duties. Um, like Craig said, that's not a get around for you. Um, you know, you've got to think of yourself in this situation and you run the risk there that HMRC, if it was ever looked at, they'll just deem that as personal income. Okay, no, that makes sense. Thank you for your answers. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I think we, we I get this question quite a lot. Can I just do them? And this comes up a, yeah. a heck of a lot on our conversations on the lounge and on the various local groups. Like, can I, because some accountants in some part of the country will say, yeah, you can do it and just will we'll count as that. Uh, but, you know, it, you just can't do it. It's, it's not worth it. It's, it, it's it not yourself it whoever gave yeah. that gave the advice. Um, and yeah, we've seen a good. number of accountancy yeah. firms have been giving that advice. But, yeah, you can't do it. I think they're going to have problems to heal. I think I think you know if if, if people if people if this ever gets looked at and, people, and again we're straying into legal territory here, we'll let the lawyers advise on this one. But you know if you're if you're receiving income um, and it ever got looked at and challenged and and you know the the, the local will turn around and say, well, lawyers told me I, you know I couldn't do the the work or the assignment without it being paid into my personal account. You know I think lawyers are going to have some problems there in the future potentially with this. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, I think uh, it's going to be interesting to see how, how fast they, they change that policy. Um, like I said, they, they are struggling to stay open, um, and this is one of the, one of the main reasons why people aren't working for them as well. So, right, um, we had one more hand up here from Helen Longcake. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, Helen. Okay, so mine's not about IR thirty five. Hopefully, it's a quick one. Um, so I have literally just this month registered as self-employed with the HMRC, but obviously I've had some expenses already, like indemnity insurance and had to renew my DBS just to register with all these companies that I want to work for. Can I claim them back as expenses when I actually paid them out before I became self-employed? Richard, is that one for you? Yeah, it, so it depends on... Um... So, so the period it relates to so if it's 
if if you're self-employed, you require those to do it, and you paid them um, for the like say you paid for the the year ahead, and you become self-employed, then then that's fine. So they're usually annual subscriptions, aren't they? Um, if it's if it's something like professional indemnity insurance, then uh, and you require it to do the work through your self-employed work, then that's fine. So it comes back to to, to what we said before: is it a requirement, and um, you know, is it necessary for your your business? And that is one of the things that 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 is necessary. So two things to look at: Do you need it for your your business, um, and also the period. So if it's something like a subscription that you use, and you know, you, 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 it's it's for the year that you became self-employed, that should be fine. Um, if it's for a previous year, then we'd say no. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very recent, just to, obviously to be self-employed. But in terms of bookkeeping, what sort of date would I put down for it? Because I've paid out for it sort of like four or five weeks before. I actually, in the eyes of the HMRC, became self-employed. That, that's fine. So you, even with like something like limited cook, so you just put it on the date you started working um yeah you, you can have things like um so for a limited company things like pre-registration costs so it's things to get you set up that you know um relate to working through your business but didn't you, you know the, your business didn't exist at the time so just keep a record of those add them on um obviously you would have paid for them personally before so you know they'll be they'll, they'll be repaid back to you or if you're sole tr- self sorry sole trader i think is what you said then you just add it into your um, profit and loss calculation as an expense. Right. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. No worries. Thank, Thank you. you. So, any uh, other questions? No more hands up. Okay. Cool. Uh, I can see there is a question in the chat, um, and you know, somebody, somebody. Um, so I'm, I can't seem to get onto the chats. I can't see that. Either. You yes, just any on the chats? Um, can you, you be both a sole trader and have a limited company? E.g. Oh, working for some companies that allow you to be paid through a company and those who don't. Um, so, yeah, th- that is something that you can do. There's nothing restricting you from uh, you know, being a, a sole trader um, and working through a limited company. You're fine to do those engagements that you know, you, you, you're allowed to do through the limited company. And then the sole trader income would simply be declared on your self-assessment tax return at the end of the year. You have to do a self-assessment anyway as the director of a limited company, so that would just be seen as uh, self-employment income uh, when that's completed. Again, that probably ties into a point of you probably need an accountant in situations like that to help you manage that income um, because you need to take into account the sole trader income when calculating what tax is going to be paid on dividends you get from your limited company, etc. But yeah, in simple answer to your question, yes, you can do both. Okay, so um, moving on to the next topic, which is um, uh, uh, just as big, if not bigger, than IR35, um, and it will eventually affect every single self-employed person out there, um, is making tax digital, um, which some of you may have heard of, or, or NTD. Um, it's something that <laughs> we're coming across more and more now, and it's 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 a huge step from HMRC, and it's part of the big digitization of tax and accounting that, that swept through um, swept through over the last 10 years or so. Um, Rich, do you just want to touch on how it how it will affect locums and, and what kind of things people need to be thinking of and what, what dates are relevant there? Yeah, so it may, it may all be something that's that's relevant uh, for, for the guys that are VAT registered. So um, the VAT uh, has been in place for, for a while now, but for um, since this, this uh, April this year, it has been called compulsory for all VAT registered businesses to be um, completing filings under making tax digital. Um, and what that is, you can no longer sort of keep a record and file your VAT return directly on HMRC's site. HMRC now require you to do the filings uh, in a compliant digital software. Um, we use FreeAgent, there are other ones out there, but it does mean um, you do need to operate that way, be registered for making tax digital and making make those submissions through that but these um, are quarterly submissions as well they're not quarterly, they're, yes they're not right. longer annual. yeah you so it's it's a quarterly submission directly through the software that you use yeah that's right and coming into play um in a, it, from april 2024 which we're not there yet but it's um everyone's sort of we're starting to move people over and 
get ready for this is um, the entities uh, um, for, for for individuals. So that's the sole traders. Uh, so anyone with uh, a trade that receives the income personally will be required to do MCD submissions if the turnover is over £10,000. Similarly, for, for anyone out there that's a landlord, um, the same requirement is for individual landlords with turnover of £10,000 each year. The difference is, it's not just a case of whacking everything on your tax return at the end of the, the tax year and working out your tax. There'll be a requirement to do digital, same as that, digital submissions each quarter. So providing an update uh, to HMRC um, of, of, of the tax due, and then there would still be a, an end of year submission as well. So the self-assessment at the end. So the guys that are just keeping a record and, you know, happily sort of, you know, doing a tax return at the end of the year, things things are going to change and, you know, you are going to require a, a compliance software to do that, which again fits in with the things we've been saying about free agents. Not only is it good practice to use these things, it's, it's going to become necessary as well um, with MCD. The, this, is, this, is, this is part of a wider move from the government to by, I think it's 2026, for all tax submissions for individuals and businesses to be done digitally and quarterly. Um, so it's more work, you know, you guys that are doing your account, that are DIY accountants, you're doing, you're doing everything yourself. It's more work for you. It's more compliance. Just make sure that you, you again, this point that Craig made earlier, make sure you're using a piece of software, you know, whether it's uh, QuickBooks or free agent who we use, you may, or, or even if you've got an existing accountant, just make sure that their software is MTD compatible. It's really important this because not all accounting and bookkeeping softwares are compatible, only certain ones. Um, so that's important because if you don't if you don't hit this, it's not your accountant that if you miss a submission, for example, if you're late, you forget to do it or you do it incorrectly, it's not your accountant that will be fined. It will be it's you that's fined direct. So it's it's important. It's incumbent on you just to make sure you've got the right processes in play. Um, it's, um, it's 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 a big thing. You know, it's going to mean a lot more work for. For, for people, especially us, um, and you know, it's just part of this this wider digitization of everything. Um, we've got the dates, haven't we, Richard, for the for the next wave of changes? Um, and they go. I think there's about I think there's four iterations to come through yet up until 2026. The point, like I said, the, the thinking then being that by then every every tax submission will be digital. Yeah. That'll be a lot of work for especially uh, for locums as well. Um, yeah keeping everything up to date pretty much on a weekly basis and making sure they get everything you know on the on the, on the system as well okay yeah. um yeah any questions any more questions yeah i mean we've, we've we've covered our agenda there so over to you guys if you if you have any questions please please raise your hands um got hamza asking raising your hand hamza all right, it's so another question uh it's a bit of a shorter one than the previous uh 35 question it's basically I understand you can write off, uh, you know, food as part of work. Uh, what's the general guidance on that? Say you're working out in a boots. Is it like, what, £5 per shift, £10 a shift? How does that look? Yeah, so when you're talking about I I35, this is a, a key thing. You can't claim for any of those costs if you are passed as inside I35. So what they're saying is we're going to tax you like an employee, but also like a general employee. You know, you can't claim for things like travel uh, and lunch costs, which, you know, actually years ago, that was that was something you could claim even when inside I-35. So they've really um, clamped down on on that. But yeah, it's not it's not an allowance. So when, when if you if you are eligible to claim those costs, so you are outside I-35 is one point. Secondly, you're working at a temporary lo location, which we sort of described before. It's sorry, the actual cost. sorry to interrupt. Just, just, just to make it absolutely crystal clear, if you're in, if you're deemed as inside IR thirty five, you are classed as employed. You are classed as an employee. Outside of IR thirty five, yeah. you're classed as self employed. Just so it's clear to everyone. Yeah, and as far as claiming the lunch costs, it's the cost that you you you, uh, you, you incur. So it is designed for when a company sends their employee out to work at a different work location. So if you if you need to go out and you've got to travel there, then you know the travel costs and the meal costs. So if you went to another location and you required to buy a meal while you, you're working there, 
you can buy the meal. So if it, whether it's a sandwich or whatever, what you can't do is uh, there's no allowance or you can't pay for the costs of, you know, for example, making a sandwich. So if you bought a loaf of bread, butter, um, you know, some tuna or whatever, then it's it's supposed to be the additional cost that you've incurred having to go out and work at the temporary location. It just happens to work out well for, you know, the contractors and locums that um, are doing temporary work. You know, it's a bit different than employees being sent out to a different site from an employer, but it does still fall into the same category. So to, to answer that, it's the actual cost of what you've incurred. And there's no caps on that, Richard. So if I'm at Boots for a month and I claim my lunch expense, that it's something from I get from the canteen every day, is that allowable? That's fine. Any um, um, any 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 costs as long as the, the, the only thing that it says is reasonable costs. So, you know, um, at the end of the day, I don't think anyone's going to be going and having a three course meal for the for the lunch. Um, and what I would say to that as well, if you do do, it's only going to produce the profit that's left at the end of the day in your your company. So, you, you know, there's no point uh, creating unnecessary costs for, 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 your, for your business. No problem. Thank, thanks for the answer. Nice one. Uh, I think we've got one more question from Miriam. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Um, just a quick one. I know you said that it depends on kind of how you file under a limited company dividends um, and how much salary we pay, etc. Um, but is there kind of a ballpark figure of where um, you're better off as a sole trader on the lower end of the scale of income? If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so. Go on, Craig. Yeah, so yeah, but I was going to say, you know, if it's your pure main source of income, you don't have employment income elsewhere. We use our general guidance is usually when you're looking at exceeding twenty five thousand within the year, is where the limited company starts to become the more beneficial option. That can change on individual circumstances, so you know it's certainly not, you know, a, a set scale you know we'd look at each individual circumstance but as a ballpark figure that's where we're looking at and um, if you have employment income elsewhere then kind of take that employment income into account and, and look at what, what difference is left a lot of the time even if you're only earning you know 10 15 000 through the limited company in addition to earning your employment income the limited company would still be more tax efficient okay perfect thank you uh, we've got, have you guys got a few more minutes? We've got a couple of more hands up. Of course, yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, Sadia Habib. Hi, I just want to ask, when does this MTD come into effect and when do we start need to acting upon it? Thank so you. the, um, the um, rollout for the self-employed individuals uh, with income in excess of over 10,000 is from April 2024. That's when it starts. So you really should start prepping yourself before that. Um, with our clients, the software that we use, the systems that we use are MTD compliant now. So nothing's really gonna change for our clients. So I think it goes back to the point that, that Dan mentioned earlier on. If you are using an accountant, make sure they're aware of it, make sure their systems are MTD compliant. I would say you probably need to be looking at getting in the routine of doing this from now, really, any time now. Uh, the sooner the better. Okay, um, does that answer your question? Yes, okay. Um, Aaron. Aaron? Hi, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, if someone was employed and self-employed, um, does it how does it affect the um the p60 you know like when you get your p60 every tax year uh, do you declare it on your self assessment does it you know does it affect it in any way i'm just a bit confused as to how how the accountant would be different from from somebody who's got um a sole trader <laughs> to come uh, yeah. so just solely self employed or limited company oh, okay yeah that so what would happen your p60 you would get that from each employer. So the P60 is the end of year, basically tax summary of all the salaries you've had throughout the throughout the year. Um, so on that, it would show your gross income and your tax paid. 
that would be used on your self-assessment. So what your self-assessment looks at is your total income for the tax year, all different kinds of income. So you could have employment income, sole trader income, dividend income, plus other things, rental income, for example. So every income that you had would need to go on the tax return. Um, and that's why we were saying before about, you know, you need to, we need to know as accountants, all the income you have to give these tax estimates because um, it does affect. So the first thing that's taxed is your salary and then any sort of um, sole trader income and rental income is taxed next. And then dividends are the final things to tax. And as I said before, there's different tax rates depending on how much income you've had. Your P60 goes on there along with your sole trader income and your uh, dividend income, for, for example. And what happens is you pay tax on your salary so on that's also on the p60 so it's added into the tax calculation and then the tax you've already paid is also entered on there and that's deducted from the tax that's calculated to give a tax due which is the amount of tax calculated minus what you've already paid leaving uh, a balance that's due hopefully that that answers the question but yeah to, just to answer it, all income needs to go on the self-assessment right so just to be clear so the p60 is just whatever you you heard from your employment by yes. the company and um, the self-assessment is an all their income that comes to you as a person. Yeah, that's right. So the P60 is from your employment and the self-assessment is your personal tax return that includes all in any income that you received in that tax year personally. Cool. Cheers. Thank you. Cool. And I think we'll have one last person question uh, from Sana. And I'm sorry, before we just move on to that, just picking up on the previous question about when, when you need to be ready on NTD, just to be clear, the VAT, the VAT submissions are all already live. Um, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there's any small businesses uh, on, on attending today, uh, so Eagle Lord, if there's any small pharmacists, but you, you guys will already need to be, be, be doing submissions. Um, the, 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 um, the changes that are coming in in, in April 24, relate to to self-employed so if you're a small business you should probably be, you should definitely be doing something now okay uh, last question from the seller hi under a limited company if i were to hire an employee for bookkeeping is there a limit on how much i can pay them the, there's not a limit so as i said before any um expense so it would be an expense for your company so it should be wholly exclusively and justifiable for your company. So what we'd say is um, pay them at a going rate. You do need to pay them. Um, so another thing, if you're an employer, you need to think about things like uh, minimum wage and things like that. So you need to, if you're paying an employee, you need to pay them minimum wage. So there are other factors to think about. Um, we do get quite a few, uh, you, you know, self-employed people looking to uh, have a, a family member as an employee, which is completely fine. Um, but, you know, think of what the going rate would be to, to pay someone for that work. Don't just pay them a salary because they're a family member and, you know, you either want to save a bit of tax or um, do them a favour by giving them some money. It's got to be justifiable. So pay them at a rate you would pay someone else. And, you know, keep in mind other things like minimum wage legislation where you're required to pay over a certain rate to, to any employee. It would be a lot cheaper for you to get uh, one of the bookkeeping tools to do it for you as well. Significantly cheaper. Um, is that all the questions, or in, does anyone have, else have any questions? Hamza. Hamza. Uh, thanks. Uh, last question is you know, you said this is being recorded. Will this be yep. uploaded on the Pharmacist Court YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll keep an eye out there then, because some of my friends couldn't make this direct work, but I'll let them know. That's right. That's right. Thanks. Just uh, just briefly, you know, hopefully uh, from today, we've, we've touched on some of the key topics, obviously, but it's um, it's obviously becoming more and more complex. If you're self-employed, there's a lot more to think about. The compliance requirements are increasing, um, and obviously it's important that you keep on top of things, especially if you're... If you're a busy locum, um, we would say this obviously, but if you're, you know, if you're a DIY accountant, you know, really think about getting some advice um, from a specialist. Um, if you've already got advisors in place or an accountant, just 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 make sure they're on top of the things that we've mentioned. Um, it is important to have someone who, who specialises in this stuff. We see it all the time. 
know you've got you've got a general practice uh, sort of old school high street accountancy firm and they're not as on the ball as, as, as they may need to be with regard to things like ir35 mtd etc um so yeah it's, it's it's really important that, that that you make sure you've got everything every all your ducks in a row Craig, do you just want to touch briefly on on how how we work and yeah and of course like if, if anybody's interested in in having a further chat chat with us you know like i said before we we, we specialize in this um, um on you know we're, we're ranked the number one tax advisor nationally on trust pilots uh, accountancy league table um you know we're, we're, th this is what we live and breathe yeah so you know as, as dan just said we, we do specialize in this area whether it be you know you're self-employed sole trader or you're working for a limited company we can cater for, for both of those services we offer the uh, access to uh, compliant bookkeeping software within our package and you also have access to a dedicated accountant so much like you know you speak to myself dan and richard today you'd have an accountant's direct email a telephone number that you can ring up you can uh, pick up the phone ask any questions we're here to to, to help you know we, we do charge a monthly fee um self-employed sole traders 50 pounds plus back per month and the limited companies 95 pounds plus back per month and um, basically that fee across the year covers all the ongoing requirements and um, support advice and submissions and uh, you know uh, obviously if you do come through and um, through the uh, pharmacy cooperative if you quote pharmacy we do offer um, two months free uh, with our service as well that's everything from our side so you live that's that's okay with you i think yeah i think that's it for today uh there's no other questions um on the q a or on the chat so Anyone i think any follow-up questions you, you can give us a yeah. call choose yeah. that or send yeah. us a yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean um i'll add the link to the phone number for uh for gorilla uh on the youtube channel on the youtube video uh and we'll share it across on the uh telegram network as well so if you need to reach out to them um can contact them or if you've got any questions you can message me as well um and i can pass your questions on so yeah uh so thanks for coming in today uh, uh dan richard and um sorry who was the other person Greg. Greg. <laughs> <laughs> sorry um, no yeah, and everyone else that's joined us today uh the video will be available on youtube uh next yes. week um probably early next week i'll we'll try and get it on there uh as i said if you've got any questions uh feel free to give us a shout um and thanks again uh, to the Gorilla team. Thanks for letting us be fine. Nice. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.